Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, today, Mother? What's the secret? The secret? The Green Tea by Joseph Sheridan Lefano. Prologue. Martin Heselius, the German physician. Though carefully educated in medicine and surgery, I have never practised either. The study of each continues, nevertheless, to interest me profoundly. Neither idleness nor caprice caused my secession from the honourable calling which I had just entered. The cause was a very trifling scratch inflicted by a dissecting knife. The trifle cost me the loss of two fingers, amputated promptly, and the more painful loss of my health, for I have never been quite well since, and have seldom been twelve months together in the same place. In my wanderings I became acquainted with Dr. Martin Heselius, a wanderer like myself, like me, a physician, and like me, an enthusiast in his profession. Unlike me in this, that his wanderings were voluntary, and he a man, if not of fortune, as we estimate fortune in England, at least in what our forefathers used to term easy circumstances. He was an old man when I first saw him, nearly five and thirty years my senior. In Dr. Martin Heselius I found my master. His knowledge was immense, his grasp of a case was an intuition. He was the very man to inspire a young enthusiast like me with awe and delight. My admiration has stood the test of time and survived the separation of death. I am sure it was well founded. For nearly twenty years I acted as his medical secretary. His immense collection of papers he has left in my care to be arranged, indexed and bound. His treatment of some of the cases is curious. He writes in two distinct characters. He describes what he saw and heard as an intelligent layman might. And when in this style of narrative he had seen the patient either through his own hall door to the light of day, or through the gates of darkness to the caverns of the dead, he returns upon the narrative, and in the terms of his art and with all the force and originality of genius, proceeds to the work of analysis, diagnosis, and illustration. Here and there, a case strikes me as of a kind to amuse or horrify a lay reader with an interest quite different from the peculiar one which it may possess for an expert. With slight modifications, chiefly of language, and of course a change of names, I copy the following. The narrator is Dr. Martin Heselius. I find it among the voluminous notes of cases which he made during a tour in England about sixty-four years ago. It is related in a series of letters to his friend, Professor Van Lu of Leiden. The professor was not a physician, but a chemist, and a man who read history and metaphysics and medicine, and had, in his day, written a play. The narrative is therefore, if somewhat less valuable as a medical record, necessarily written in a manner more likely to interest an unlearned reader. These letters from a memorandum attached, appear to have been returned on the death of the professor in 1819 to Dr. Heselius. They are written, some in English, some in French, but the greater part in German. I am a faithful, though I am conscious, by no means a graceful translator, and although here and there I omit some passages, and shorten others, and disguise names, I have interpolated nothing. Chapter 1 Dr. Heselius relates how he met the Reverend Mr. Jennings. The Reverend Mr. Jennings is tall and thin. He is middle-aged and dresses with a natty, old-fashioned, high church precision. He is naturally a little stately, but not at all stiff. His features, without being handsome, are well-formed, and their expression extremely kind, but also shy. I met him one evening at Lady Mary Hayduke's. The modesty and benevolence of his countenance are extremely prepossessing. We were but a small party, and he joined agreeably enough in the conversation. He seems to enjoy listening very much more than contributing to the talk. But what he says is always to the purpose and well said. 
He is a great favourite of Lady Mary's, who, it seems, consults him upon many things, and thinks him the most happy and blessed person on earth. Little knows she about him. The Reverend Mr. Jennings is a bachelor, and has, they say, sixty thousand pounds in the funds. He is a charitable man. He is most anxious to be actively employed in his sacred profession, and yet, though always tolerably well elsewhere, when he goes down to his vicarage in Warwickshire to engage in the actual duties of his sacred calling, his health soon fails him, and in a very strange way, so says Lady Mary. There is no doubt that Mr. Jennings's health does break down in generally a sudden and mysterious way, sometimes in the very act of officiating in his old and pretty church at Kenlis. It may be his heart, it may be his brain, but so it has happened three or four times, or oftener, that after proceeding a certain way in the service, he has on a sudden stopped short, and after a silence, apparently quite unable to resume, he has fallen into solitary, inaudible prayer, his hands and his eyes uplifted, and then, pale as death, and in the agitation of a strange shame and horror, descended trembling and got into the vestry room leaving his congregation without explanation to themselves. This occurred when his curate was absent. When he goes down to Kenlis now, he always takes care to provide a clergyman to share his duty and to supply his place on the instant should he become thus suddenly incapacitated. When Mr. Jennings breaks down quite and beats a retreat from the vicarage and returns to London, where, in a dark street off Piccadilly, he inhabits a very narrow house. Lady Mary says that he is always perfectly well. I have my own opinion about that. There are degrees, of course. We shall see. Mr. Jennings is a perfectly gentlemanlike man. People, however, remark something odd. There is an impression a little ambiguous. One thing which certainly contributes to it, people, I think, don't remember, or perhaps distinctly remark, but I did, almost immediately. Mr. Jennings has a way of looking sidelong upon the carpet, as if his eye followed the movements of something there. This, of course, is not always, it occurs now and then, but often enough to give a certain oddity, as I have said, to his manner, and in this glance travelling along the floor there is something both shy and anxious. A medical philosopher, as you are good enough to call me, elaborating theories by the aid of cases sought out by himself, and by him watched and scrutinised with more time at command, and consequently infinitely more minuteness than the ordinary practitioner can afford, falls insensibly into habits of observation, which accompany him everywhere, and are exercised, as some people would say, impertinently, upon every subject that presents itself with the least likelihood of rewarding inquiry. There was a promise of this kind in the slight, timid, kindly, but reserved gentleman whom I met for the first time at this agreeable little evening gathering. I observed, of course, more than I here sat down, but I reserve all that borders on the technical for a strictly scientific paper. I may remark that when I here speak of medical science, I do so, as I hope some day, to see it more generally understood, in a much more comprehensive sense than its generally material treatment would warrant. I believe the entire natural world is but the ultimate expression of that spiritual world, from which, and in which alone, it has its life. I believe that the essential man is a spirit that the spirit is an organised substance, but as different in point of material from what we ordinarily understand by matter, as light or electricity is, that the material body is, in the most literal sense, a vesture, and death, consequently, no interruption of the living man's existence, but simply his extrication from the natural body, a process which commences at the moment of what we term death and the completion of which, at furthest, a few days later, is the resurrection in power. 
The person who weighs the consequences of these positions will probably see their practical bearing upon medical science. This is, however, by no means the proper place for displaying the proofs and discussing the consequences of this too generally unrecognized state of facts. In pursuance of my habit, I was covertly observing Mr. Jennings with all my caution, and I think he perceived it, and I saw plainly that he was as cautiously observing me. Lady Mary happening to address me by name as Dr. Hesselius, I saw that he glanced at me more sharply and then became thoughtful for a few minutes. After this, as I conversed with a gentleman at the other end of the room, I saw him look at me more steadily and with an interest which I thought I understood. I then saw him take an opportunity of chatting with Lady Mary and was, as one always is, perfectly aware of being the subject of a distant inquiry and answer. This tall clergyman approached me by and by, and in a little time we had got into conversation. When two people who like reading and who know books and places, having travelled, wish to discourse, it is very strange if they can't find topics. It was not accident that brought him near me and led him into conversation. He knew German and had read my essays on metaphysical medicine, which suggest more than they actually say. This courteous man, gentle, shy, plainly a man of thought and reading, who moving and talking among us was not altogether of us, and whom I already suspected of leading a life whose transactions and alarms were carefully concealed with an impenetrable reserve from not only the world, but his best beloved friends, was cautiously weighing in his own mind the idea of taking a certain step with regard to me. I penetrated his thoughts without his being aware of it, and was careful to say nothing which could betray to his sensitive vigilance my suspicions respecting his position, or my surmises about his plans respecting myself. We chatted upon indifferent subjects for a time, but at last, he said, I was um, uh, very much interested by some papers of yours, Dr. Hesselius, uh, upon what you term uh, metaphysical medicine. I read them in German mm, ten or twelve years ago. Have they been translated? No, I'm sure they haven't. I should have heard. They would have asked my leave, I would think. I asked the publishers here a few months ago to get the book for me in the original German, but they tell me it's out of print. So it is, and has been for some years but it flatters me as an author to find that you have not forgotten my little book, although, I added, laughing, ten or twelve years is a considerable time to have managed without it. But I suppose you have been turning the subject over again in your mind, or uh, something has happened lately to revive your interest in it. At this remark, accompanied by a glance of inquiry, a sudden embarrassment disturbed Mr. Jennings. Analogous to that which makes a young lady blush and look foolish, he dropped his eyes and folded his hands together uneasily and looked oddly, and you would have said guiltily, for a moment. I helped him out of his awkwardness in the best way by appearing not to observe it and going straight on. I said, those revivals of interest in the subject happen to me often. One book suggests another and often sends me back a wild goose chase over an interval of twenty years. But if you still care to possess a copy, I shall be only too happy to provide you. I've still got two or three by me. And if you allow me to present one, I shall be very much honoured. You are very good indeed, he said, quite at his ease again in a moment. Pray don't say a word. The thing is really so little worth that I am only ashamed of having offered it. And if you thank me any more, I shall throw it into the fire in a fit of modesty. Mr. Jennings laughed, he inquired where I was staying in London, and after a little more conversation on a variety of subjects, he took his departure. Chapter 2 The Doctor Questions Lady Mary, and She Answers I like your vicar so much, Lady Mary, said I, as soon as he was gone. He has read, travelled, and thought and having also suffered, he ought to be an accomplished companion. So he is, and better still, he is a really good man, said she. 
His advice is invaluable about my schools and all my little undertakings at Dalbridge, and he's so painstaking. He takes so much trouble, you have no idea wherever he thinks he can be of use. He's so good-natured and sensible. It's pleasant to hear so good an account of his neighbourly virtues. I can only testify to his being an agreeable and gentle companion, and in addition to what you have told me, I think I can tell you two or three things about him, said I. Really? Yes. To begin with, he's unmarried. Yes, that's right. Go on. He has been writing. That is, he was. But for two or three years, perhaps, he has not gone on with his work. And the book was upon some rather abstract subject, perhaps theology. Well, he was writing a book, as you say. I'm not quite sure what it was about but only that it was nothing that I cared for. Very likely you're right, and he certainly did stop, yes. And although he only drank a little coffee here tonight, he likes tea, at least, did like it extravagantly. Yes, that's quite true. He drank green tea a good deal, didn't he? I pursued. Well, that's very odd. Green tea was a subject on which you used almost to quarrel. But he has quite given that up, said I. So he has. And now, one more fact. His mother or his father, did you know them? Yes, sir, both. His father is only ten years dead, and their place is near Dalbridge. We knew them very well, she answered. Well, either his mother or his father, I should rather think his father, saw a ghost, said I. Well, you really are a conjurer, Dr. Heselius. Conjurer or no, haven't I said right? I answered merrily. You certainly have. And it was his father. He was a silent, whimsical man, and he used to bore my father about his dreams. And at last he told him a story about a ghost he had seen and talked with. And a very odd story it was. I remember it particularly because I was so afraid of him. This story was long before he died, when I was quite a child, and his ways were so silent and moping and he used to drop in sometimes in the dusk when I was alone in the drawing room, and I used to fancy there were ghosts about him. I smiled and nodded. And now, having established my character as a conjurer, I think I must say good night, said I. But how did you find it out? By the planets, of course, as the gypsies do, I answered, and so gaily we said good night. The next morning I sent the little book he had been inquiring after and a note to Mr. Jennings, and on returning later that evening, I found that he had called at my lodgings and left his card. He asked whether I was at home, and asked at what hour he would be most likely to find me. Does he intend opening his case and consulting me professionally, as they say? I hope so. I have already conceived a theory about him. It is supported by Lady Mary's answers to my parting questions. I should like much to ascertain from his own lips. But what can I do consistently with good breeding to invite a confession? Nothing. I rather think he meditates one. At all events, my dear Van L., I shan't make myself difficult of access. I mean to return his visit tomorrow. It will be only civil in return for his politeness to ask to see him. Perhaps something may come of it. Whether much, little, or nothing, my dear Van El, you shall hear. Chapter 3 Dr. Heselius Picks Up Something in Latin Books Well, I have called at Blank Street. On inquiring at the door, the servant told me that Mr. Jennings was engaged very particularly with a gentleman, a clergyman from Kenlis, his parish in the country. Intending to reserve my privilege and to call again, I merely intimated that I should try another time, and had turned to go, when the servant begged my pardon and asked me, looking at me a little more attentively than well-bred persons of his order usually do, whether I was Dr. Heselius, and, on learning that I was, he said, Perhaps then, sir, you would allow me to mention it to Mr. Jennings, for I am sure he wishes to see you. The servant returned in a moment with a message from Mr. Jennings, asking me to go to his study, which was, in effect, his back drawing-room. 
promising to be with me in a very few minutes. This was really a study, almost a library. The room was lofty, with two tall slender windows and rich dark curtains. It was much larger than I had expected, and stored with books on every side, from the floor to the ceiling. The upper carpet, for to my tread it felt that there were two or three, was a turkey carpet. My steps fell noiselessly. The bookcases standing out placed the windows, particularly narrow ones, in deep recesses. The effect of the room was, although extremely comfortable and even luxurious, decidedly gloomy, and aided by the silence, almost oppressive. Perhaps, however, I ought to have allowed something for association. My mind had connected peculiar ideas with Mr. Jennings. I stepped into this perfectly silent room of a very silent house with a peculiar foreboding and its darkness and solemn clothing of books, for except where two narrow looking-glasses were set in the wall, they were everywhere, helped this sombre feeling. While awaiting Mr. Jennings' arrival, I amused myself by looking into some of the books with which his shelves were laden. Not among these, but immediately under them, with their backs upward on the floor, I lighted upon a complete set of Swedenborg's Arcana Celestia, in the original Latin, a very fine folio set, bound in natty livery which theology affects, pure vellum, namely gold letters, and carmine edges. There were paper markers in several of these volumes. I raised and placed them, one after the other, upon the table, and opening where these papers were placed, I read in the solemn Latin phraseology a series of sentences indicated by a penciled line at the margin. Of these, I copy here a few, translating them into English. When man's interior sight is opened, which is that of his spirit, then there appear the things of another life, which cannot possibly be made visible to the bodily sight. By the internal sight, it has been granted me to see the things that are in the other life more clearly than I see those that are in the world. From these considerations, it is evident that external vision exists from interior vision, and this from a vision still more interior, and so on. There are with every man at least two evil spirits. With wicked genii, there is also a fluent speech, but harsh and grating. There is also among them a speech which is not fluent, wherein the descent of the thoughts is perceived as something secretly creeping along within it. The evil spirits associated with man are indeed from the hells, but when with man, they are not then in hell, but are taken out thence. The place where they then are is in the midst between heaven and hell, and is called the world of spirits, where the evil spirits who are with man are in that world, they are not in infernal torment, but in every thought and affection of man, and so in all that the man himself enjoys. But when they are remitted into their hell, they return to their former state. If evil spirits could perceive that they were associated with man, and yet that they were spirits separate from him, and if they could flow into the things of his body, they would attempt by a thousand means to destroy him. For they hate man with a deadly hatred. Knowing, therefore, that I was a man in the body, they were continually striving to destroy me, not as to the body only, but especially as to the soul. For to destroy any man or spirit is the very delight of the life of all who are in hell. But I have been continually protected by the Lord. Hence, it appears how dangerous it is for man to be in a living consort with spirits, unless he be in the good of faith.
Nothing is more carefully guarded from the knowledge of associate spirits than their being thus conjoint with a man. For if they knew it, they would speak to him with the intention to destroy him. The delight of hell is to do evil to a man and to hasten his eternal ruin. A long note written with a very sharp and fine pencil in Mr. Jennings' neat hand at the foot of the page caught my eye. Expecting his criticism upon the text, I read a word or two and stopped, for it was something quite different, and began with these words. Deus miserea me. May God compassionate me. Thus warned of its private nature, I averted my eyes and shut the book replacing all the volumes as I had found them, except one, which interested me, and in which, as men studious and solitary in their habits will do, I grew so absorbed as to take no cognizance of the outer world, nor to remember where I was. I was reading some pages which refer to representatives and correspondents in the technical language of Swedenborg, and had arrived at a passage, the substance of which is that evil spirits when seen by other eyes than those of their infernal associates, present themselves by correspondence in the shape of the beast, Fera, which represent their particular lust and life in aspect direful and atrocious. This is a long passage and particularizes a number of those bestial forms. Chapter 4 Four eyes were reading the passage. I was running the head of my pencil case along the line as I read it, and something caused me to raise my eyes. Directly before me was one of the mirrors I have mentioned, in which I saw reflected the tall shape of my friend, Mr. Jennings, leaning over my shoulder and reading the page at which I was busy, and with a face so dark and wild that I should hardly have known him. I turned and rose. He stood erect also, and with an effort, laughed a little, saying, I came in and asked you how you did, but without succeeding in awaking you from your book. So I couldn't restrain my curiosity, and very impertinently, I'm afraid, peeped over your shoulder. This is not your first time of looking into those pages. You have looked into Swedenborg, no doubt, long ago. Oh dear, yes, I owe Swedenborg a great deal. You'll discover traces of him in the little book on metaphysical medicine which you were so good as to remember. Although my friend affected a gaiety of manner, there was a slight flush in his face, and I could perceive that he was inwardly much perturbed. I'm scarcely yet qualified. I know so little of Swedenborg. I've only had them a fortnight, he answered. And I, and I think they're rather likely to make a solitary man nervous. That, that is, judging from the very little I've read. I don't say that they have made me so, he laughed, and I'm so very much obliged for the book. I hope you got my note. I made all proper acknowledgments and modest disclaimers. I never read a book that I go with so entirely as that of yours, he continued. I saw at once there is more in it than is quite enfolded. Do you know Dr. Harley? he asked, rather abruptly. In passing, the editor remarks that the physician here named was one of the most eminent who had ever practised in England. I did, having had letters to him, and had experienced from him great courtesy and considerable assistance during my visit to England. I think that man one of the very greatest fools I ever met in my life, said Mr. Jennings. This was the first time I had ever heard him say a sharp thing of anybody, and such a term applied to so high a name a little startled me. Really? And in what way? I asked. In his profession, he answered. I smiled. I mean this, he said. He seems to me one half blind. I mean, one half of all he looks at is dark, preternaturally bright and vivid all the rest, and the worst of it is... It seems willful. I can't get him. I mean, he won't. I've had some experience of him as a physician, but I look on him as, in that sense, no better than a paralytic mind, an intellect half dead. I'll tell you, I know I shall sometime, all about it, he said, 
with a little agitation. You stay some months longer in England. If I should be out of town during your stay for a little time, would you allow me to trouble you with a letter? But I, I should be only too happy, I assured him. Very good of you. I am so utterly dissatisfied with Harley. A, a little leaning to the materialistic school, I said. A mere materialist, he corrected me. You can't think how that sort of thing worries one who knows better. You won't tell anyone, any of my friends you know, that I am hippish now, for instance. No one knows, not even Lady Mary, that I have seen Dr. Harley or any other doctor, so pray don't mention it. And if I should have any threatening of an attack, you, you'll kindly let me write, or should I be in town, have a little talk with you. I was full of conjecture, and unconsciously I found I had fixed my eyes gravely on him for he lowered his for a moment and said, I see you think I might as well tell you now, or else you're forming a conjecture, but you may as well give it up. If you were guessing all the rest of your life, you'll never hit on it. He shook his head smiling, and over that wintry sunshine, a black cloud suddenly came down, and he drew his breath in, through his teeth, as men do in pain. Sorry, of course, to learn that you apprehend occasion to consult any of us, but command me when and how you like. I need not assure you that your confidence is sacred. He then talked of quite other things, and in a comparatively cheerful way, and after a little time, I took my leave. Chapter 5 Dr. Hesselius is summoned to Richmond. We parted cheerfully, but he was not cheerful nor was I. There are certain expressions of that powerful organ of spirit, the human face, which, although I have seen them often and possess a doctor's nerve, yet disturb me profoundly. One look of Mr. Jennings haunted me. It had seized my imagination with so dismal a power that I changed my plans for the evening and went to the opera, feeling that I wanted a change of ideas. I heard nothing of or from him for two days or three days when a note in his hand reached me. It was cheerful and full of hope. He said that he had been for some little time so much better, quite well in fact, that he was going to make a little experiment and run down for a month or so to his parish to try whether a little work might not quite set him up. There was in it a fervent religious expression of gratitude for his restoration, as he now almost hoped he might call it. A day or two later, I saw Lady Mary, who repeated what his note had announced and told me he was actually in Warwickshire, having resumed his clerical duties at Kenlis, and she added, I begin to think that he's really perfectly well, or that there was never anything the matter, more than nerves and fancy. We're all nervous, but I fancy that there's nothing like a little hard work for that kind of weakness, and he has made up his mind to try it. I should not be surprised if he didn't come back for a year. Notwithstanding all this confidence, only two days later I had this note dated from his house off Piccadilly. Dear Sir, I have returned disappointed. If I should feel at all able to see you, I shall write to ask you kindly to call. At present I am too low, and in fact simply unable to say all I wish to say. By and by, please God, you shall hear from me. I mean to take a run into Shropshire where some of my people are. God bless you. May we on my return meet more happily than I can now write. About a week after this I saw Lady Mary at her own house, the last person she said left in town and just on the wing for Brighton, for the London season was quite over. She told me that she had heard from Mr. Jennings' niece Martha in Shropshire. There was nothing to be gathered from her letter, more than that he was low and nervous. In those words of which healthy people think so lightly, what a world of suffering is sometimes hidden. Nearly five weeks had passed without any further news of Mr. Jennings. At the end of that time, I received a note from him. He wrote, I have been in the country and have had a change of air, change of scene, change of faces, a change of everything, and in everything but myself. I have made up my mind, so far as the most irresolute creature on earth can do it, to tell my case fully to you. If your engagements will permit, 
pray, come to me today, tomorrow, or the next day. But pray, defer as little as possible. You know not how much I need help. I have a quiet house at Richmond, where I now am. Perhaps you can manage to come to dinner, or to luncheon, or even to tea. You shall have no trouble in finding me out. The servant at Blank Street, who takes this note, will have a carriage at your door, at any hour you please, and I am always to be found. You will say that I ought not to be alone. I have tried everything. Come and see. I called up the servant, and decided on going out the same evening, which accordingly I did. He would have been much better in a lodging house or hotel, I thought, as I drove up through a short double row of sombre elms to a very old-fashioned brick house, darkened by the foliage of these trees, which overtopped and nearly surrounded it. It was a perverse choice, for nothing could be imagined more triste and silent. The house I found belonged to him. He had stayed for a day or two in town, and finding it for some cause insupportable, had come out here, probably because being furnished and his own, he was relieved of the thought and delay of selection by coming here. The sun had already set, and the red reflected light of the western sky illuminated the scene with the peculiar effect with which we are all familiar. The hall seemed very dark, but getting to the back drawing-room, whose windows commanded the west, I was again in the same dusky light. I sat down, looking out upon the richly wooded landscape that glowed in the grand and melancholy light which was every moment fading. The corners of the room were already dark. All was growing dim and the gloom was insensibly toning my mind, already prepared for what was sinister. I was waiting, alone, for his arrival, which soon took place. The door communicating with the front room opened, and the tall figure of Mr. Jennings, faintly seen in the ruddy twilight, came with quiet, stealthy steps into the room. We shook hands, and taking a chair to the window, where there was still light enough to enable us to see each other's faces, he sat down beside me, and placing his hand upon my arm, with scarcely a word of preface, began his narrative. Chapter 6. How Mr. Jennings Met His Companion The faint glow of the west, the pomp of the then lonely woods of Richmond were before us, behind and about us, the darkening room, and on the stony face of the sufferer, for the character of his face, though still gentle and sweet, was changed, rested that dim, odd glow which seems to descend and produce where it touches lights, sudden though faint, which are lost, almost without gradation, in darkness. The silence, too, was utter. Not a distant wheel or bark or whistle from without and within the depressing stillness of an invalid bachelor's house. I guessed well the nature, though not even vaguely, the particulars of the revelations I was about to receive from that fixed face of suffering that so oddly flushed stood out like a portrait of Shalkins before its background of darkness. It, it began, he said, on the 15th of October, three years and eleven weeks ago, and two days, I keep a very accurate account, for every day is torment. If I leave anywhere a chasm in my narrative, tell me. About four years ago I began a work which had cost me very much thought and reading. It was upon the religious metaphysics of the ancients. I know, said I, the actual religion of educated and thinking paganism quite apart from symbolic worship, a wide and very interesting field. Yes, but not good for the mind, the Christian mind, I mean. Paganism is all bound together in essential unity and with evil sympathy. Their religion involves their art, and both their manners and the subject is a degrading fascination, and the nemesis, sure. God forgive me. I wrote a great deal. I wrote late at night. I was always thinking on the subject, walking about, wherever I was, everywhere. It thoroughly infected me. 
You are to remember that all the material ideas connected with it were more or less of the beautiful, the subject itself delightfully interesting, and I then, without a care, he sighed heavily. I believe that everyone who sets about writing in earnest does his work, as a friend of mine phrased it, on something, tea or coffee or, or tobacco. I suppose there's a material waste that must be hourly supplied in such occupations, and that we should grow too abstracted, and the mind, as it were, pass out of the body unless it were reminded often enough of the connection by actual sensation. At all events, I felt the want, and I supplied it. Tea was my companion. At first the ordinary black tea, made in the usual way, not too strong, but I drank a good deal and increased its strength as I went on. I never experienced an uncomfortable symptom from it. I began to take a little green tea. I found the effect pleasanter. It cleared and intensified the power of thought, so I had come to take it frequently, but not stronger than one might take it for pleasure. I wrote a great deal out here. It was so quiet, and in this room. I used to sit up very late, and it became a habit with me to sip my tea, a green tea, every now and then as my work proceeded. I had a little kettle on my table that swung over a lamp and made tea two or three times between eleven o'clock and two or three in the morning, my hours of going to bed. I used to go into town every day. I wasn't a monk, and although I spent an hour or two in the library hunting up authorities and looking out lights upon my theme, I was in no morbid state as far as I can judge. I met my friends pretty much as usual and enjoyed their society and on the whole, existence had never been, I think, so pleasant before. I had met with a man who had some odd old books, German editions in medieval Latin, and I was only too happy to be permitted access to them. This obliging person's books were in the city, a very out-of-the-way part of it, and I had rather outstayed my intended hour, and on coming out, seeing no cab near, I was tempted to get into the omnibus, which used to drive past this house, it was darker than this by the time the bus had reached an old house, you may have remarked, with four poplars at each side of the door. And there, the last passenger but myself got out. We drove along rather faster. It was twilight now. I leaned back in my corner, next to the door, ruminating pleasantly. The interior of the omnibus was nearly dark. I had observed in the corner opposite me, at the other side, and at the end next to the horses, two small circular reflections, as it seemed to me, of a reddish light. They were about two inches apart, and about the size of those small brass buttons that yachting men used to put on their jackets. I began to speculate, as listless men will, upon this trifle, as it seemed. From what centre did that faint but deep red light come? And from what, glass beads, buttons, toy decorations, was it reflected? We were lumbering along gently, having nearly a mile still to go. I hadn't solved the puzzle, and it became in another minute more odd, for these two luminous points, with a sudden jerk, descended nearer and nearer the floor, keeping still their relative distance and horizontal position, and then, as suddenly, they rose to the level of the seat on which I was sitting, and I saw them no more. My curiosity was now really excited, and before I had time to think, I saw again these two dull lamps again, together, near the floor. Again they disappeared, and again in their old corner I saw them. So, keeping my eyes upon them, I edged quietly up my own side towards the end at which I saw these tiny discs of red. There was very little light in the bus, it was nearly dark. I leaned forward to aid my endeavour to discover what these little circles really were. They shifted position a little as I did so. I began now to perceive an outline of something black, and I soon saw with tolerable distinctness the outline of a small black monkey pushing its face forward in mimicry to meet mine. Those were its eyes, and I now dimly saw its teeth grinning at me and drew back, not knowing whether it might not meditate a spring. 
I fancied that one of the passengers had forgot this ugly pet, and wishing to ascertain something of its temper, though not caring to trust my fingers to it, I poked my umbrella swiftly towards it. It remained immovable, up to it, through it, for through it and back and forward it passed, without the slightest resistance. I can't in the least convey to you the kind of horror that I felt when I had ascertained that the thing was an illusion, as I then supposed, there came a misgiving about myself and a terror that fascinated me in impotence to remove my gaze from the eyes of the brute for some moments. As I looked, it made a little skip back, quite into the corner, and I, in a panic, found myself at the door, having put my head out drawing deep breaths of the outer air and staring at the lights and trees we were passing, too glad to reassure myself of reality. I stopped the bus and got out. I perceived the man looked oddly at me as I paid him. I dare say there was something unusual in my looks and manner, for I had never felt so strangely before. Chapter 7 The Journey First Stage when the omnibus drove on, and I was alone upon the road, I looked carefully round to ascertain whether the monkey had followed me. To my indescribable relief, I saw it nowhere. I can't describe easily what a shock I had received, and my sense of genuine gratitude on finding myself, as I supposed, quite rid of it. I had got out a little before we reached this house, two or three hundred steps, a brick wall runs along the footpath, and inside the wall is a hedge of yew, or some dark evergreen of that kind, and within that again the row of fine trees which you may have remarked as you came. This brick wall is about as high as my shoulder, and happening to raise my eyes, I saw the monkey, with that stooping gait, on all fours, walking or creeping, close beside me, on top of the wall. I stopped looking at it with a feeling of loathing and horror. As I stopped, so did it. It sat upon the wall with its long hands on its knees, looking at me. There was not light enough to see it much more than in outline, nor was it dark enough to bring the peculiar light of its eyes into strong relief. I still saw, however, that red foggy light plainly enough. It didn't show its teeth nor exhibit any sign of irritation, but seemed jaded and sulky and was observing me steadily. I drew back into the middle of the road. It was an unconscious recoil, and there I stood, still looking at it. It didn't move. With an instinctive determination to try something, anything, I turned about and walked briskly towards town with a scant look all the time watching the movements of the beast. It crept swiftly along the wall at exactly my pace. Where the wall ends, near the turn of the road, it came down, and with a, a wiry spring or two brought itself close to my feet and continued to keep up with me as I quickened my pace. It was at my left side, so close to my leg, that I felt every moment as if I should tread upon it. The road was quite deserted and silent, and it was darker every moment. I stopped, dismayed and bewildered, turning as I did so the other way, I mean towards this house, away from which I had been walking. When I stood still, the monkey drew back to a distance of, I suppose, about five or six yards, and remained stationary, watching me. I had been more agitated than I have said. I have read, of course, as everyone has, something about spectral illusions, as you physicians term the phenomena of such cases. I considered my situation and looked my misfortune in the face. These affections I had read are sometimes transitory and sometimes obstinate. I had read of cases in which the appearance, at first harmless, had, step by step, degenerated into something direful and insupportable and ended by wearing its victim out. Still, as I stood there, but for my bestial companion, quite alone, I tried to comfort myself 
by repeating again and again the assurance, the thing is purely disease, a well-known physical affection, as distinctly as smallpox or neuralgia. Doctors are all agreed on that. Philosophy demonstrates it. I mustn't be a fool. I've been sitting up too late, and I dare say my digestion's quite wrong, and with God's help, I shall be all right. And this is but a symptom of nervous dyspepsia. Did I believe all this? Not one word of it. No more than any other miserable being ever did who is once seized and riveted in this satanic captivity. Against my convictions, I might say my knowledge, I was simply bullying myself into a false courage. I now walked homeward. I had only a few hundred yards to go. I had forced myself into a sort of resignation, but I had not got over the sickening shock and the flurry of the first certainty of my misfortune. I made up my mind to pass the night at home. The brute moved close beside me, and I fancied there was the sort of anxious drawing towards the house which one sees in tired horses or dogs, sometimes as they come towards home. I was afraid to go into town. I was afraid of anyone seeing and recognising me. I was conscious of an irrepressible agitation in my manner. Also, I was afraid of any violent change in my habits, such as going to a place of amusement or walking from home in order to fatigue myself. At the hall door it waited till I mounted the steps, and when the door was opened, entered with me. I drank no tea that night. I got cigars and some brandy and water. My idea was that I should act upon my material system and by living for a while in sensation apart from thought, send myself forcibly, as it were, into a new groove. I came up here, to this drawing room. I sat just here. The monkey then got upon a small table that then stood there. It looked dazed and languid. An irrepressible uneasiness as to its movements kept my eyes always upon it. Its eyes were half closed, but I could see them glow. It was looking steadily at me. In all situations, at all hours, it is awake and looking at me. That never changes. I shall not continue in detail my narrative of this particular night. I shall describe rather the phenomena of the first year, which never varied essentially. I shall describe the monkey as it appeared in daylight. In the dark, as you shall presently hear, there are peculiarities. It is a small monkey, perfectly black. It had only one peculiarity, a character of malignity unfathomable malignity. During the first year it looked sullen and sick, but this character of intense malice and vigilance was always underlying that surly languor. During all that time it acted as if on a plan of giving me as little trouble as was consistent with watching me. Its eyes were never off me. I have never lost sight of it, except in my sleep, light or dark, day or night, since it came here, except when it withdraws for some weeks at a time, unaccountably. In total dark, it is visible as in daylight. I, I do not mean merely its eyes. It is all visible, distinctly, in a halo that resembles a glow of red embers and which accompanies it in all its movements. When it leaves me for a time, it's always at night, in the dark, and in the same way. It grows at first uneasy, and then furious, and then advances towards me, grinning and shaking, its paws clenched, and at the same time there comes the appearance of fire in the grate. I never have any fire, I can't sleep in the room when there is any, and it draws nearer and nearer to the chimney quivering, it seems, with rage, 
and when its fury rises to the highest pitch, it springs into the grate and up the chimney, and I see it no more. When this first happened, I thought I was released. I was now a new man. A day passed, a night, and no return. And a blessed week, a week, another week. I was always on my knees, Dr. Hesselius, always thanking God and praying. A whole month passed of liberty, but on a sudden, it was with me again. Chapter 8 The Second Stage It was with me, and the malice which before was torpid under a sullen exterior was now active. It was perfectly unchanged in every other respect. This new energy was apparent in its activity and its looks, and soon in other ways. For a time, you will understand, the change was shown only in an increased vivacity and an air of menace as if it were always brooding over some atrocious plan. Its eyes, as before, were never off me. Is it here now? I asked. No, he replied. It has been absent exactly a fortnight and a day, fifteen days. It has sometimes been away so long as nearly two months, once for three. Its absence always exceeds a fortnight, although it may be but by a single day. Fifteen days having passed since I saw it last, it may return now at any moment. Is its return, I asked, accompanied by any uh, peculiar manifestation? Nothing, no, he said. It, it is simply with me again. On lifting my eyes from a book or turning my head, I see it, as usual, looking at me. And then it remains, as before, for its appointed time. I have never told so much and so minutely before to anyone. I perceived that he was agitated and looking like death, and he repeatedly applied his handkerchief to his forehead. I suggested that he might be tired, and told him that I would call with his pleasure in the morning. But he said, No, if you don't mind hearing it all now. I have got so far, and I should prefer making one effort of it. When I spoke to Dr. Harley, I had nothing like so much to tell. You were a philosophic physician. You give spirit its proper rank. If this thing is real, he paused, looking at me with agitated inquiry. We can discuss it by and by and very fully, and I will give you all I think, I answered after an interval. Well, very well. If it is anything real, I say, it is prevailing little by little and drawing me more interiorly into hell. Optic nerves he talked of. Ah, well, there are other nerves of communication. May God Almighty help me. You shall hear. Its power of action, I tell you, has increased. Its malice became in a way aggressive. About two years ago, some questions that were pending between me and the bishop having been settled, I went down to my parish in Warwickshire, anxious to find occupation in my profession. I wasn't prepared for what happened, although I have since thought I might have apprehended something like it. The reason of my saying so is this. He was beginning to speak with a great deal more effort and reluctance, and sighed often, and seemed at times nearly overcome. But at this time his manner was not agitated. It was more like that of a sinking patient who has given himself up. Yes, but I'll first tell you about Kenlis, my parish. It was with me when I left this place for Dolbridge. It was my silent travelling companion and it remained with me at the vicarage. When I entered on the discharge of my duties, another change took place. The thing exhibited an atrocious determination to thwart me. It was with me in the church, in the reading desk, in the pulpit, within the communion rails. At last it reached this extremity, that while I was reading to the congregation, it would spring upon the book and squat there, so that I was unable to see the page. This happened more than once. I left Dalbridge for a time. I placed myself in Dr. Harley's hands. I did everything he told me. He gave my case a great deal of thought. It, it interested him, I think. He seemed successful. For nearly three months I was perfectly free from a return. I began to think I was safe. 
With his full assent, I returned to Dalbridge. I travelled in the sheds. I was in good spirits. I was more. I was happy and grateful. I was returning, as I thought, delivered from a dreadful hallucination to the scene of duties which I longed to enter upon. It was a beautiful sunny evening. Everything looked serene and cheerful, and I was delighted. I remember looking out of the window to see the spire of my church at Kenlis among the trees, at the point where one has the earliest view of it. It's exactly where the little stream that bounds the parish passes under the road by a culvert, and where it emerges at the roadside, a stone with an old inscription is placed. As we passed this point, I drew my head in and sat down and in the corner of the chaise was the monkey. For a moment I felt faint, and then, quite wild with despair and horror, I called to the driver and got out and sat down at the roadside and prayed to God silently for mercy. A despairing resignation supervened. My companion was with me as I re-entered the vicarage. The same persecution followed. After a short struggle, I submitted, and soon I left the place. I told you, he said, that the beast has before this become in certain ways aggressive. I'll explain a little. It seemed to be actuated by intense and increasing fury whenever I said my prayers, or even meditated prayer. It amounted at last to a dreadful interruption. You will ask, how could a silent, immaterial phantom effect that? It was thus, whenever I meditated praying, it was always before me, and nearer, and nearer. It used to spring on a table, on the back of a chair, on the chimney piece, and slowly to swing itself from side to side, looking at me all the time. There is in its motion an indefinable power to dissipate thought, and to contract one's attention to that monotony till the idea shrink, as it were, to a point, and at last, to nothing. And unless I had started up and shook off the catalepsy, I have felt as if my mind were on the point of losing itself. There are other ways, he sighed heavily. Thus, for instance, when I pray with my eyes closed, it comes closer and closer and I see it. I know it's not to be accounted for physically, but I do actually see it though my lids are closed, and so it rocks my mind, as it were, and overpowers me, and I'm obliged to rise from my knees. If you had ever yourself known this, you would be acquainted with desperation. Chapter 9 The Third Stage <clears throat> I see, Dr. Hesalius, that you don't lose one word of my statement. I need not ask you to listen specially to what I am now going to tell you. They talk of the optic nerves and of spectral illusions, as if the organ of sight was the only point assailable by the influences that have fastened upon me. I know better. For two years in my direful case that limitation prevailed. But as food is taken in softly at the lips and then brought under the teeth, as the tip of the little finger caught in a mill crank will draw in the hand and the arm and the whole body. So the miserable mortal, who has once been caught firmly by the end of the finest fibre of his nerve, is drawn in and in by the enormous machinery of hell, until he is as I am, yes, doctor, as I am. For while I talk to you, and implore relief. I feel that my prayer is for the impossible, and my pleading with the inexorable. I endeavoured to calm his visibly increasing agitation, and told him that he must not despair. While we talked, the night had overtaken us. The filmy moonlight was wide over the scene which the window commanded, and I said, Perhaps you'd prefer having candles. This light, you know, is, is odd. I should wish you as much as possible under your usual conditions while I make my diagnosis, shall I call it. Otherwise, I don't care. All lights are the same to me, he said, except when I read or write. I care not if night were perpetual. And I'm going to tell you what happened about a year ago. 
the thing began to speak to me. Speak? How do you mean? Speak as a man does, do you mean? Yes, speak in words and consecutive sentences with perfect coherence and articulation. But there is a peculiarity. It's not like the tone of a human voice. It's not by my ears it reaches me. It comes like a singing through my head. This faculty, the power of speaking to me, will be my undoing. It won't let me pray. It interrupts me with dreadful blasphemies. I dare not go on. I, I could not. Oh, doctor, can the skill and thought and prayers of man avail me nothing? You must promise me, dear sir, not to trouble yourself with unnecessarily exciting thoughts. Confine yourself strictly to the narrative of facts, and recollect, above all, that even if the thing that infests you be, you seem to suppose a reality with an actual independent life and will, yet it can have no power to hurt you, unless it be given from above. Its access to your senses depends mainly upon your physical condition. This is, under God, your comfort and reliance. We are all alike environed. It is only that in your case, the parius, the veil of the flesh, the screen, is a little out of repair, and sights and sounds are transmitted. We must enter on a new course, sir. Be encouraged. I'll give tonight to the careful consideration of the whole case. You are very good, sir. Y you think it worth trying. You don't give me quite up. But, sir, you don't know. It is gaining such an influence over me. It orders me about. It is such a tyrant. And I'm growing so helpless. May God deliver me. It orders you about, uh, of course you mean by speech. Yes, yes. It's always urging me to crimes, to injure others, or myself. You see, doctor, the situation is urgent. It is indeed. When I was in Shropshire a few weeks ago, Mr. Jennings was speaking rapidly and trembling now, holding my arm with one hand and looking in my face. I went out one day with a party of friends for a walk. My persecutor, I tell you, was with me at the time. I lagged behind the rest. The country near the D, you know, is beautiful. Our path happened to lie near a coal mine, and at the verge of the wood is a perpendicular shaft, they say, a hundred and fifty feet deep. My niece had remained behind with me. She knows, of course, nothing of the nature of my sufferings. She knew, however, that I had been ill and was low, and she remained to prevent my being quite alone. As we loitered slowly on together, the brute that accompanied me was urging me to throw myself down the shaft. I tell you now, oh sir, think of it. The one consideration that saved me from that hideous death was the fear lest the shock of witnessing the occurrence should be too much for the poor girl. I asked her to go on and walk with her friends, saying that I could go no further. She made excuses, and the more I urged her, the firmer she became. She looked doubtful and frightened. I suppose there was something in my looks or manner that alarmed her, but she wouldn't go on, and that literally saved me. You have no idea, sir, that a living man could be made so abject a slave of Satan, he said with a ghastly groan and a shudder. There was a pause here, and I said, You were preserved, nevertheless. It was the act of God. You are in his hands and in the power of no other being. Be therefore confident for the future. Chapter 10. Home I made him have candles lighted, and saw the room looking cheery and inhabited before I left him. I told him that he must regard his illness strictly as one dependent on physical, though subtle physical, causes. I told him that he had evidence of God's care and love in the deliverance which he had just described, and that I had perceived with pain that he seemed to regard its peculiar features as indicating that he had been delivered over to spiritual reprobation. Than such a conclusion nothing could be, I insisted, less warranted, and not only so, but more contrary to facts, as disclosed in his mysterious deliverance from that murderous influence during his Shropshire excursion. First, his niece had been retained by his side without his intending to keep her near him, and secondly, 
there had been infused into his mind an irresistible repugnance to execute the dreadful suggestion in her presence. As I reasoned this point with him, Mr. Jennings wept. He seemed comforted. One promise I exacted, which was that should the monkey at any time return, I should be sent for immediately, and repeating my assurance that I would give neither time nor thought to any other subject until I had thoroughly investigated his case, and that tomorrow he should hear the result, I took my leave. Before getting into the carriage, I told the servant that his master was far from well, and that he should make a point of frequently looking into his room. My own arrangements I made with a view to being quite secure from interruption. I merely called at my lodgings, and with a travelling desk and carpet bag, set off in a hackney carriage for an inn about two miles out of town called The Horns, a very quiet and comfortable house with good thick walls. And there I resolved, without the possibility of intrusion or distraction, to devote some hours of the night in my comfortable sitting room to Mr. Jennings's case, and so much of the morning as it might require. There occurs here a careful note of Dr. Hesselius's opinion upon the case, and of the habits, dietary, and medicines which he prescribed. It is curious, some persons would say mystical, but on the whole, I doubt whether it would sufficiently interest a reader of the kind I am likely to meet with to warrant its being here reprinted. The whole letter was plainly written at the inn where he had hid himself for the occasion. The next letter is dated from his town lodgings. I left town for the inn where I slept last night at half past nine and did not arrive at my room in town until one o'clock this afternoon. I found a letter in Mr. Jennings's hand upon my table. It had not come by post, and on inquiry I learned that Mr. Jennings's servant had brought it, and on learning that I was not to return until today, and that no one could tell him my address, he seemed very uncomfortable, and said his orders from his master were that he was not to return without an answer. I opened the letter and read, Dear Dr. Heselius, it is here. You had not been an hour gone when it returned. It is speaking. It knows all that has happened. It knows everything. It knows you, and is frantic and atrocious. It reviles. I send you this. It knows every word I have written, I write. This I promised, and therefore write. But I fear very confused, very incoherently. I am so interrupted, disturbed, ever yours, sincerely yours, Robert Linder Jennings. When did this come? I asked. About eleven last night. The man was here again and has been here three times today. The last time is about an hour since. Thus answered, and with the notes I had made upon his case in my pocket, I was in a few minutes driving towards Richmond to see Mr. Jennings. I by no means, as you perceive, despaired of Mr. Jennings's case. He had himself remembered and applied, though quite in a mistaken way, the principle which I lay down in my metaphysical medicine, and which governs all such cases. I was about to apply it in earnest. I was profoundly interested and very anxious to see and examine him while the enemy was actually present. I drove up to the sombre house and ran up the steps and knocked. The door in a little time was opened by a tall woman in black silk. She looked ill and as if she had been crying. She curtsied and heard my question, but she did not answer. She turned her face away, extending her hand towards two men who were coming downstairs, and thus having, as it were, tacitly made me over to them, she passed through a side door hastily and shut it. The man who was nearest the hall I at once accosted, but being now close to him, I was shocked to see that both his hands were covered with blood. I drew back a little, and the man, passing downstairs, merely said in a low tone, Here's the servant, sir. The servant had stopped on the stairs, confounded and dumb at seeing me. He was rubbing his hands in a handkerchief, and it was steeped in blood. Jones, what is it? What's happened? I asked, while a sickening suspicion overpowered me. The man asked me to come up to the lobby. I was beside him in a moment, and frowning and pallid, with contracted eyes, he told me the horror which I already half-guessed. 
his master, had made away with himself. I went upstairs with him to the room. What I saw there I won't tell you. He had cut his throat with his razor. It was a frightful gash. The two men had laid him on the bed and composed his limbs. It had happened, as the immense pool of blood on the floor declared, at some distance between the bed and the window. There was carpet round his bed and a carpet under his dressing table, but none on the rest of the floor, for the man said he did not like a carpet on his bedroom. In this sombre and now terrible room, one of the great elms that darkened the house was slowly moving the shadow of one of its great boughs upon this dreadful floor. I beckoned to the servant, and we went downstairs together. I turned off the hall into an old-fashioned panelled room, and there standing, I heard all the servant had to tell. It was not a great deal. I concluded, sir, from your words and looks, sir, as you left last night, that you thought my master was seriously ill. I thought it might be that you were afraid of a fit or something. So I attended very close to your directions. He sat up late till past three o'clock. He wasn't writing or reading. He was talking a great deal to himself, but that was nothing unusual. At about that hour, I assisted him to undress and left him in his slippers and dressing gown. I went back softly in about half an hour. He was in his bed, quite undressed, and a pair of candles lighted on the table beside his bed. He was leaning on his elbow and looking out at the other side of the bed when I came in. I asked him if he wanted anything, but he said no. I don't know whether it was what you said to me, sir, or, or something a little unusual about him, but I was uneasy, uncommon uneasy about him last night. In another half hour, or it might be a little more, I went up again. I didn't hear him talking as before. I opened the door a little. The candles were both out, which was not usual. I had a bedroom candle, and I let the light in a little bit, looking softly round. I saw him sitting in that chair beside the dressing table, with his clothes on again. He turned round and looked at me. I thought it strange he should get up and dress and put out the candles to sit in the dark that way. But I only asked him again if I could do anything for him. He said, no, rather sharp, I thought. I asked him if I might light the candles, and he said, do as you like, Jones. So I lighted them, and I lingered about the room. And he said, tell me the truth, Jones. Why did you come again? You didn't hear anyone cursing. No, sir, I said, wondering what he could mean. No, he said after me. Of course, no. And I said to him, wouldn't it be well, sir, you went to bed? It's just five o'clock. And he said nothing, but very likely. Good night, Jones. So I went, sir. But in less than an hour I came again. The door was fast, and he heard me, and called, as I thought, from the bed to know what I wanted, and he desired me not to disturb him again. I lay down and slept for a little. It must have been between six and seven when I went up again. The door was still fast, and he made no answer. So I didn't like to disturb him, and thinking he was asleep, I left him till nine. It was his custom to ring when he wished me to come, and I had no particular hour for calling him. I tapped very gently, and getting no answer, I stayed away a good while, supposing he was getting some rest then. It wasn't till eleven o'clock I grew really uncomfortable about him, for at the latest he was never, that I could remember, later than half past ten. I got no answer. I knocked and called, and still no answer. So, not being able to force the door, I called Thomas from the stables, and together we forced it, and found him in the shocking way you saw. Jones had no more to tell. Poor Mr. Jennings was very gentle, and very kind. All his people were very fond of him. I could see that the servant was very much moved. So, dejected and agitated, I passed from that terrible house and its dark canopy of elms, and I hope I shall never see it more. While I write to you, I feel like a man who has but half waked from a frightful and monotonous dream. My memory rejects the picture with incredulity and horror, yet I know it is true. It is the story of the process of a poison, 
a poison which excites the reciprocal action of spirit and nerve and paralyzes the tissue that separates those cognate functions of the senses, the external and the interior. Thus we find strange bedfellows and the mortal and immortal prematurely make acquaintance. Conclusion A word for those who suffer. My dear Van L, you have suffered from an affection similar to that which I have just described. You twice complained of a return of it. Who under God cured you? Your humble servant, Martin Hesselius. Let me rather adopt the more emphasized piety of a certain good old French surgeon of three hundred years ago. I treated and God cured you. Come, my friend, you are not to be hippish. Let me tell you a fact. I have met with and treated, as my book shows, fifty-seven cases of this kind of vision, which I term indifferently sublimated, precocious, and interior. There is another class of affections which are truly termed, though commonly confounded with those which I describe, spectral illusions. These latter I look upon as being no less simply curable than a cold in the head or a trifling dyspepsia. It is those which rank in the first category that test our promptitude of thought. Fifty-seven such cases have I encountered, neither more nor less. And in how many of those cases have I failed? In no one single instance. There is no one affliction of mortality more easily and certainly reducible with a little patience and a rational confidence in the physician. With these simple conditions, I look upon the cures absolutely certain. You are to remember that I had not even commenced to treat Mr. Jennings's case. I have not any doubt that I should have cured him perfectly in 18 months, or possibly it might have extended to two years. Some cases are very rapidly curable, others extremely tedious. Every intelligent physician who will give thought and diligence to the task will effect a cure. You know my tract on the cardinal functions of the brain. I there, by the evidence of innumerable facts, prove, as I think, the high probability of a circulation arterial and venous in its mechanism through the nerves. Of this system, thus considered, the brain is the heart. The fluid, which is propagated hence through one class of nerves, returns in an altered state through another, and the nature of that fluid is spiritual though not immaterial, any more than, as I before remarked, light or electricity are so. By various abuses, among which the habitual use of such agents as green tea is one, this fluid may be affected as to its quality, but it is more frequently disturbed as to equilibrium, this fluid being that which we have in common with spirits, a congestion found upon the masses of brain or nerve connected with the interior sense, forms a surface unduly exposed, on which disembodied spirits may operate. Communication is thus more or less effectually established. Between this brain circulation and the heart circulation there is an intimate sympathy. The seat, or rather the instrument of exterior vision, is the eye. The seat of interior vision is the nervous tissue and brain, immediately about and above the eyebrow. You remember how effectually I dissipated your pictures by the simple application of iced eau de cologne. Few cases, however, can be treated exactly alike with anything like rapid success. Cold acts powerfully as a repellent of the nervous fluid. Long enough continued, it will even produce that permanent insensibility which we call numbness, and a little longer, muscular as well as sensational paralysis. I have not, I repeat, the slightest doubt that I should have first dimmed and ultimately sealed that inner eye which Mr. Jennings had inadvertently opened. The same senses are opened in delirium tremens and entirely shut up again when the overaction of the cerebral heart and the prodigious nervous congestions that attend it are terminated by a decided change in the state of the body. It is by acting steadily upon the body by a simple process that this result is produced and inevitably produced. I have never yet failed. 
poor Mr. Jennings made away with himself. But that catastrophe was the result of a totally different malady, which, as it were, projected itself upon the disease which was established. His case was in a distinctive manner a complication, and the complaint under which he really succumbed was hereditary suicidal mania. Poor Mr. Jennings, I cannot call a patient of mine, for I had not even begun to treat his case, and he had not yet given me, I am convinced, his full and unreserved confidence. If the patient do not array himself on the side of the disease, his cure is certain. So that was Green Tea by Joseph Sheridan Lefano. We've done Carmilla by Sheridan Lefano, which in, to me is a more satisfying story. But this is quite a famous story. It comes from his collection Through a Glass Darkly, which was published in 1872 and consists of a collection of stories where the hero is the metaphysical physician. Dr. Heselius. Now, people have commented how Stoker's Van Helsing may be derived from Heselius. Um, I've just finished doing Dracula, so old Van Helsing is very much on my mind. They're quite different characters, I think. Van Helsing is very theatrical, but they're both metaphysical physicians. And of course, you know that Stoker at one point worked for uh, Lefano in Dublin. So, you know, the two men knew each other. And Dracula owes a lot to Carmilla. As a vampire story, but back to old Sheridan Lefano. Okay, so he died when he was only 58. He was born in Dublin in Ireland in 1814 and died in the same city in 1873. And of his generation, he is considered the best writer of macabre and ghost stories. M.R. James thought he was pretty good. Lefano, as you could maybe tell from the name, his, his family were of mixed Huguenot French. Of course, the Huguenot French were the Protestant French who fled the persecution during the religious wars and, and came to Great Britain, came to England as a Protestant country. And because England at that time had occupied Ireland, some of them went to Ireland as well, hence the Huguenots in Dublin, which was the Protestant hegemony, I guess. And of course, the other side was English Sheridan. And Brinsley Sheridan, the playwright, was his great uncle. There's a lot of writers in his family. His dad was a clergyman, a Protestant clergyman, and quite Calvinistic. But he wasn't very rich, and they, they didn't have a great time. I don't think they had much money. And they got involved in the Tithe War in the 1830s in Ireland. So the Tithe War was under the English occupation of Ireland, the British occupation of Ireland. Was it British at that time? Yeah, it was 1830s. The, the majority Catholic population were obliged to pay tithes, one-tenth of their income, to the Protestant minority church. So that was not very popular. And there were uprisings, and old uh, Lefano's dad was kicked out of Limerick or returned from Limerick during that time. Lefano went to study law at Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, but even from an early age, he uh, wrote ghost stories for the local papers. One nice thing about him was that he took part in a campaign against the British government's indifference to the potato famine, when lots of people were dying in Ireland of starvation and the British government did not really do much about it and let them die. We could, you could say actively. And I think the view of many Irish people would be they connived in the decimation of the Irish population for their own causes, you know. And anyway, let's not get into that. Okay, so he, he married and his wife had a lot of mental health problems. I don't think he was a happy guy, really. And he died in 1873, only 58. He was a prolific writer as well as being in the legal profession. Green Tea is a funny old story. It's a long story. It's an hour and a half, even edited, when, when I read it. And I'm a fast reader. People say that. We, we get comments about that. So it is a long story. When you read critiques of it on the internet, they quite rightly point out from our point of view, reading in 2021, this is, there's no way anybody would publish this story now. It is, it is so unfashionable, okay? It, it's a frame story, and the frame story is this unnamed narrator who is the collector of Aselius's papers in a similar way. Later, Conan Doyle will have Watson collect his detective's papers. 
So it's a frame. There's a lot of kind of philosophical ramblings, both at the beginning. We have him he, about Swedenborg. Swedenborg was a, a very uh, influential Swedish spiritualist philosopher with a quite a convoluted and complicated system of how the spiritual world, wor world worked. But he was very influential in his time, and Lefano, we know, was very interested in these things. So Lefano spent some time in his story probably telling us theories that are dear to his heart, which any modern publisher would tell a writer to cut out because they are not integral to the story. So we get quotes about Swedenborg's view of the spirit. The only thing that is relevant to the story is a quote about how a man can have evil spirits attached to him, sometimes two, and sometimes they take animal form. Aha, here's a foreshadowing. This is the monkey coming up. So that is actually probably your publisher, your editor would have let you kept that bit in. A lot of the rest of it would have gone. And it's Swedenborg and Swedenborg, Sheridan Lefanu talking about his own theories. Anyway, then we have the story. There's lots of telling, not so much showing. So to me, this long story, it consists of two elements. The first is the story. And that is interesting in itself. And it's surrounded by a shell of philosophy, which is also interesting, but for a different reason. It probably, he could have taken that out as an essay on um, his spiritual beliefs. Anyway, we'll go on. We'll look at the story first. We are bound to see parallels in other stories, such as Guy de Montpassant's The Hauler and uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, just to quote two that we've read out on the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. Are these hallucinations? Or is it a spiritual presence? And Lafanu's conclusion is mixed. I think he's saying that spiritual entities can influence the human mind to create what is in fact a spiritual illness. And basically, I think what he's saying is, in essence, green tea has opened his inner eye and he's seeing inner visions. And if only he'd let Heselius get some I stowed a cologne and put it on his forehead, on his third eye, then he would have been cured. But unfortunately, he had another problem, which was hereditary suicidal mania. So the, so the story itself is of, of an encroaching, increasing madness, habitation, haunting, if you like, of this monkey, whether it be a spirit, whether it be a hallucination. Now, we've got to understand that Lefano is interested in this spiritual world anyway. And in his time, psychiatry at this time was just emerging from medicine. It was trying to be scientific, so it was coming up with theories for these bewildering symptoms. So what we've got is, what if somebody came to see me today, I'd probably give him a little, but maybe try him a little bit of risperidone just to see if that helped. We would, we would clearly diagnose this person with a psychotic illness. Now, psychosis, to my mind, is a symptom. So you can get psychosis, which we would describe as a, 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 a separating from reality. So uh, neurosis, of course, is whereby we, we are distressed, but we keep our grip on the common reality. And psychosis, traditionally, is where we've lost that understanding of, of we don't agree with other people about things. You know, we have delusions and hallucinations, which we are convinced are true which other people don't believe in, but we will not listen to them. I think we've even moved on from that definition now to my mind. But anyway, so to me, of course, his ideas about mental illness are really interesting. And our, our period piece, looking back at an attempt to understand it. Now, I'm not saying we understand it. Certainly we don't cure mental illness very well. Um, and we, I don't think we totally understand it. I've got my own theories about things, but again, this isn't, we can't really talk about that now. Because, so I think the two elements out of the story are the haunting by the monkey, which is a horror story, really, and then surrounded by these theories of mental illness. And you, you remember the last piece would have been cut by any modern editor. It's basically Heselius setting out his theory that there is an analogous fluid, which is spiritual. And when he says spiritual, he talks about it being like light or electricity. So it's non-material but it's not supernatural. And he believes it's a kind of essence that passes through the nervous system and that the brain acts on this fluid as the heart does to the, 
to blood the circulatory system, you know? And that it's a plausible theory. It is similar to Chinese medicine's theories of qi, of this bioenergy that flows through the body. Uh, and it has certain centers, such as this eye. So that, I think that's really interesting that his, his um, theories have parallels in both modern science and Chinese medicine and spiritualism. So I've got to be careful I don't get carried away with that because I think that's, that's, that is an interesting part, but I do think we could have separated it and we could have had the monkey haunting much more concise. And probably we don't need Dr. Hazelius in it either. But there we are. Here's me rewriting a 150-year-old story, which has done quite well without me. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I love the fact that it's green tea that is this poisonous subject because, you know, yoga teachers love green tea. We're told it's such a gentle, lovely, lovely thing to drink. It's the devil's brew, clearly the devil's brew. The only the other thing I want to say is prompted by another book I've been reading recently, which is Mark Fisher's The Weird and Eerie. I don't know how I've been so long coming to this book. Fisher, the late Mark Fisher, sadly, who took his own life, made away with himself very tragically. He, and he was such a brilliant guy. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh, you know, in so many ways, he had a lot to offer. What he's saying is, um, he, he talks about, first of all, the uncanny, which is Freud's unheimlich. And he says in passing that the uncanny is always about doubling up things that are images of themselves, which are not quite the same. Okay. He doesn't really go into it massively. He then talks about the weird. The weird is a ju juxtaposition of the familiar with the unfamiliar. So you think of the surrealists and it's shocking value comes from something that should not be there like a UFO. And this can send you mad, of course, in, in the literature, in the weird literature, because this thing is so shocking. It is so unexpected. It so upturns our sense of our map of reality that the weird is, is frightening in that way. So the weird is the monkey appearing. This should not be here. So there is a weird, definitely a weird element. Fisher goes on to talk about the eerie. So the eerie is something different. The eerie is about agency. We wonder who is doing this. So we can have eerie ruins like Stonehenge. The agency is clouded. Why did they do this? We didn't know who did it. We thought it was the Druids, but it wasn't. But why did they do it, you know? We talk about the eerie cry of a bird. Why is, why is this cry coming? Who, who and why are doing things? So we do have a bit of the eerie in the monkey story. What does the monkey want? Lefanu thinks that an evil spirit, as per Swedenborg, has latched onto this poor guy who's opened his eye through the use of green tea so he can see them and he should just not. And of course, that's another theme of horror stories. Don't go where you're not supposed to. Don't read the book you're not supposed to read. Don't get the forbidden knowledge. And in this case, it was green tea. I'm going to avoid it. I don't really like it anyway, actually. I prefer black tea, which apparently is okay. You know, so that's fine. Green tea opens your inner eye if you drink too much of it. It's a bit like LSD in some ways then. So why do I think it is not just a hallucination in Lefanu? I think because the action of the monkey is to particularly hates him uh, reading scripture and doing his godly work. And he talks about it being satanic. So it comes from his a Christian view, basically, of a world that is plagued by evil monsters, evil demons. You can even trace that back. As I'm on a roll now, I've been having too much green tea, black tea, actually. This idea of a world peopled with demons is very Semitic. So it goes back to Jewish folklore, Solomon, and the demons that he bound in the brass vessel. And we find it in Babylonian and other, the other Semitic tribal groups down there. I think Pazuzu, who is um, the demon in The Exorcist, you know, the Sumerian demon. So this idea that the world is plagued is, is, is ultimately a Semitic idea. Mm, I, I could be challenged on that, but I think it's, it's, it's worth saying at this time of night anyway. Right, so it's an evil spirit in the shape of a monkey, and he only sees it because of the use of green tea. Uh, and he was reading pagan works about to do his book, which was a bad thing. So he was working too hard, too late, reading paganism. And he, 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 com he compacted that mistake by having too much green tea. Inner eye opens, hence the monkey. Now, from a psychiatric point of view, 
as I said, this is a hallucination that gives him command, command hallucinations. Now, very interestingly, most, if you talk about schizophrenia, it is, and he's too old to be schizophrenic, I think, and too young to be paraphrenic, although we don't talk about paraphrenia much anymore. We used to split into schizophrenia for younger people and paraphrenia for older people. Now we just call it one disease, probably a brain disease, to be honest. And um, it's, it is characterized by auditory hallucinations, typically. When we start seeing visual hallucinations, I always tend to think that is associated with a kind of a more organic delirium. Not necessarily a, you know, a tumor or anything like that, but things like delirium tremens from coming off alcohol or a, a pure delirium due to an infection. Those are the kind of things we associate with visual hallucination, certain kinds of dementia, pics and Lewy bodies and things like that. Anyway, very interesting, long story, lots and lots of themes, all of which deserve more time to go into than this. But that's all the time I've got. That's it. I'm very tired. So in my, my news is uh, moving house, probably, almost certainly, soonish. So there may be a hiatus in the production of these. The weather hasn't been too good. It's miserable. May should be beautiful. It's raining all the time. Nah, rain and bits of sunshine. But it's not warm. It's cold. On the mountains, there's still snow. Seagulls are pretty active. Cars are still rotten around here. Still rotten. Rotten gearboxes making a heck of a noise as they go past my door. You may hear some of them. That's about it, I think. I'm working three days a week, but I'm busier on this with this and YouTube and Substack and all this. I'm busier than I've ever been. Which is good, really. Anyway, ramble, 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 ramble. I hope you're all well. If you could, I'll tell you what, I haven't done a call to action for a long time. I should have a little jingle. Call to action. And what I'd like you to do is tell somebody about the podcast stroke YouTube channel and say, hey, actually, that's, I've just started to think there's lots of stuff going on on the YouTube channel. Lots of people talking about why I shouldn't be reading stories, A, narrated by a woman character, B, written by a woman. I'm like, okay. And some people have this strange idea that there's like a whole company of us here that I, I could just pick a host of actors to do, oh, you, Jeanette, do this one. But you know, it's only me. So I have to be Scottish, Australian, man, woman, monkey, anything. And the whole issue of cultural appropriation comes up. Is it okay for me to read a story written by somebody from China? Or is that, is, am I imperialistically grabbing? Or should I therefore do an Italian story? Or can I do, read a story as an Italian woman, written by an Italian woman? Or, you know, a Scottish woman? Or, because I'm not a woman and I'm not Scottish. It just gets too crazy. So all I'm doing is reading stories, eh? That's it. I'm just reading you stories that I like, hopefully you like. Let's not get too involved in, in all of this kind of rubbish. Uh, let, I'm just going to keep reading stories, eh? And if people don't like it, I tell you what, mate, listen to somebody else. Crack on. Anyway, there we go. Rant over. See, I've, I'm now should be going to bed and I'm, I've got myself all agitated about that. By and large, people are very kind. You are, because you've listened this long. You must be, at least long-suffering. Anyway, you all take care. I am off to bed. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back. back, don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody